Before I tell you my story today, I want to start with this phrase. It's a Bantu proverb that I learned while working in Southern Africa. Loosely translated, it means I am because we are or people are people through other people. So I never represent myself or tell my story without thanking the people who make me, who've made me who I am. First and foremost, my friends and family, especially my mother and father for a lifetime of support, my wife, Catherine Kim, and my son and daughter for their continued support. Um, I also have to thank the funding uh, uh, sources <laughs> for the research that I've done. And this is also my disclosure. I have been funded by the chemical manufacturers, but they've since decided they don't like to hang out with me so much. That's okay. I want to thank all the students that have been involved, especially the undergraduates in blue, my current laboratory, for providing a great environment with an incredibly diverse group of people that I'm certain that I learn a lot more from them than they learn from me. So now my story. About a week ago, I was in the Minneapolis airport to give a similar talk, and the person, I was in, the, in, the, in a restaurant, and the person who took my order and brought me my food uh, asked why, well, what brings you to the Twin Cities? And I said, well, I'm giving a talk in McAllister College where my daughter is, I'm a professor of biology. And she said, wow, you don't look like a professor. <laughs> and I looked up and I said, well, that's funny because you look exactly like a waitress. And I, <laughs> I don't, I don't I, you know, I don't normally judge people by their appearance, but she had the apron and the name tag and the tablet. And, and actually, the end of the story is not true. That's, that's the thing where you go, gee, I wish I had said. <laughs> what I said was, thanks for the compliment, but I didn't really mean it because I didn't really take it as a compliment. But not only do I not look like a professor, for most of my life, I haven't felt like a professor. For most of my life, I felt like just a little boy who likes frogs who's been trying to answer this question on this book that my mom says she read to me as a baby. I don't remember it, but my mom says it's true. That all changed a few years ago when a chemical company, the largest chemical company in the world, asked me to use my expertise in studying frog hormones to try to understand if the chemical, their number one selling product, a weed killer, atrazine, if it interfered with their hormones somehow. Long story short, we examined the African clawed frog in my lab, we exposed them to this chemical atrazine, and we showed things like this, and these are testes. And you don't have to have a PhD or be a frog expert to see that there's a difference between the control and the exposed animals. The control testes, if you look at it under the microscope, is full of sperm soldiers ready to go. The atrazine-treated gonad or testes, the testicular tubules are filled with cellular debris. What's more is if you look at the young developing larvae, you often find sometimes, uh, these are the kidneys, if you're not used to looking at frog gonads, that this is an individual though that has testes, then it has more ovaries, then it has another testes, then it has more ovaries. One pair will get you in enough trouble. This, guy, <laughs> this situation is certainly not typical of amphibians. There are fish that are naturally hermaphrodites, but not amphibians. We later showed that some of these animals grow up, even though they're genetic males, to be become completely functioning reproductive females, even though they were genetic males. We showed that in other species, the gonads look like this. So those are the testis on the top, and all of that junk in the trunk on the bottom, those are all eggs that are bursting through the surface of this male's testis. Now, I showed this to the Environmental Protection Agency because I thought they'd be interested. After all, it's the number one selling chemical in the, in, in, the, in the world at the time. And they said, well, that's not really an adverse effect that would stimulate us to reassess the chemical. Now, my wife tells me that there is nothing more painful in life than childbirth. I'm gonna have to give her that. But I would guess that a dozen chicken eggs popping out of my testicles <laughs> would have to be at least in the top five most painful experiences. <laughs> the EPA doesn't think so. I thought more about why this might happen. So, for example, if this were your testis, you should make testosterone. Testosterone's a portmanteau. You know, I learned that word at age 49. So when you put two words together, like smoke and fog, you get smog. Twist and jerk, you get twerk. Testosterone <laughs> means testicular hormone. It's literally the male hormone. But we hypothesized that this atrazine turned on an enzyme aromatase that caused the testosterone to be converted to estrogen. And if you're a male, that means that you're using up your testosterone so you don't make sperm, but it also means that you're making the female hormone when, when you, you shouldn't be. So then I started to think, we published that. We published that in proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences and, and Nature, very prestigious journals, journals that, that'll get you a tenured professorship at a place like UC Berkeley. But journals that, as my mom says, 
how important can it be? Barnes and Noble's never heard of them. And I started to think, though, about how my work might imply things beyond frogs. So this is a pond in Lake Nabugabo in Uganda where I started to think that this agricultural runoff might not only affect the frogs and the fish, but also the other animals that are drinking out of the water, including the humans that collect their drinking and cooking water from this same source. Because see, we all make estrogen in the exact same way and use it in the same way. The connection to contaminants in water might not be so obvious for us, that this is my village, but things like Erin Brockovich's story and things like Flint, Michigan remind us that we don't necessarily have the resources that we think we have, the clean sources of water. A colleague of mine showed, because I don't study humans, I had to work with other people on this, that if you look at men in Columbia, Missouri, and compare the atrazine in their urine, men who have atrazine in their urine have a low sperm count and can't get their wives pregnant. And by the way, this is the same amount of atrazine, 0.1 parts per billion, that we were using to chemically castrate and feminize our frogs. Another colleague showed, and I've mashed the data down now, because these are atrazine levels of men who work in the fields in California, and these are atrazine levels of men who apply atrazine in California. 2,400 parts per billion. They have 24,000 times the atrazine in their urine than we use to chemically castrate frogs and fish. 24,000 times what we know is already having a negative impact on men in Columbia, Missouri. One of these guys could pee in a bucket and I can dilute it 24,000 times and use the atrazine in their urine to chemically castrate and feminize 24,000 buckets of 30 tadpoles each. Then a little boy who likes frogs learns phrases like environmental justice because most of these individuals are Latinx or in California, Mexican, Mexican American. And then I thought about the impact that increasing estrogen would have on humans because the estrogen, atrazine has the same effect in human cells. If you take human cancer cells, and we've done some of this work, that don't normally make aromatase or estrogen, and give them astrazine, they start making estrogen. Just like we've shown in fish, and frogs, and rats, and reptiles, and in birds. What's more is if you look at prostate cancer, there's an 8.4-fold increase in prostate cancer in their factory where they make atrazine in a community that's 80% black, 80% African-American. There's studies showing that there's correlations between atrazine in their drinking water and breast cancer incidents in women in Kentucky. And that's just a correlation, but their own laboratory showed in 1994 that if you give rats atrazine, you increase the incidence of mammary cancer or breast cancer above animals that aren't exposed. This is an interesting problem because breast cancer, the number one cancer in women, is estrogen dependent. And this aromatase that I've talked about produces the estrogen during breast cancer that stimulates those breast cancers to grow and divide and turn into tumors and spread. In fact, the role of aromatase is so important in breast cancer that the number one treatment for breast cancer right now is a chemical called letrozole. It works by knocking out aromatase, decreasing estrogen, so that even if you have cancerous cells, they don't grow and turn into a tumor. That drug, though, has to work against the 80 million pounds of atrazine that we're using every year. That's the number one contaminant of drinking water that does exactly the opposite. I got in trouble because I pointed out that Novartis Oncology in the year 2000 offered treatments for cancers that range from breast cancer. So the same company that gave us 80 million pounds of this contaminant associated with breast cancer was also selling a chemical that does the opposite to treat breast cancer. Yeah, they, they weren't too happy about me pointing that out. I became concerned. I'm just a little boy who likes, fro likes frogs, but I became concerned because if you look at 13, the top 13 cancers you're going to get in this country, blacks, African Americans are more likely to get 11 out of the 13 and more likely to die from 13 out of 13. Biology? My colleagues who are experts in cancers tell me that the, less than 30% of cancer can be explained by genetics. That means that when the doctor tells you that you're going to get breast cancer, more likely if your, bro your sister, your aunt, or somebody in your family has it, they're not telling you you have bad genes necessarily. They're telling you that you've been exposed to the same crap as the rest of your family. Because if you're a minority, if you're an immigrant, if you're first generation, if you're low income, you're more likely to live in and more likely to work in areas where you're exposed to chemicals that we know are associated with adverse health outcomes. What's more is with the exception of HeLa cells, the, the cancer cells that we use to study cancer don't come from minorities. So even if we find the cure, Coleman, it may not be applicable to people who would need it the most. 
So I think what's happened is my interest in this aquatic organism has taught me a great deal about this aquatic organism. Because we all start out as aquatic in the amniotic fluid. And these chemicals that I study in my tadpoles can cross the placenta. In fact, we now know that you, that your children will be exposed to over 300 synthetic chemicals before they leave the womb. And most of them, we have no idea what the biological impact is. For atrazine, we do know from rats, which are a proxy for us, that if you give rats atrazine, an EPA lab showed those rats are more likely to have an abortion. Of those rats that don't have an abortion, the sons are born with prostate disease. Of those rats that don't abort, the daughters are born with impaired mammary development such that when they grow up, their offspring experience retarded growth and development. And it was these studies that moved me to most, that made me realize I can't just be a little boy who likes frogs. Because see that rat on the bottom? That rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. The rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. So when I think about my little girl, my son, the fact that my grandchildren, that your grandchildren, could be affected by chemicals that we're using today, it moved me in a very different way than just a little boy who likes frogs. It's just a correlation, but we already know, studies have already been done by the Center for Disease Control and others, that if you get pregnant doing peak atrazine contamination, you're more likely to have babies with birth defects, including malformed genitals in the male babies. The EPA has acknowledged this, but they say, quote, a monetary value is assigned to disease impairments and shortened lives and weighed against the benefits of keeping a chemical in use. A monetary value. If you look at California, I'm often giving this talk outside of California, we're the fifth or seventh, depends on who you talk to, largest economy in the world because of agriculture, not because of tech or, or, or Hollywood. We produce 50% of the U.S.'s food. Half of the U.S.'s food comes from California. As a result, we use more pesticides than any other state, and 90% of the workers are Latinx. If I put in red here the top 10 counties for agriculture, these are the counties, the 30% that makes us the fifth largest economy in the world. What if I plot onto that the 30 poorest towns in California? Environmental justice. So the people who make us the fifth largest economy in the world are the same people who are paying that cost that the EPA talks about. And so when I thought about this as a little boy who likes frogs, it motivated me to cross the line, so to speak. Crossing that line costs me. The chemical manufacturers set out to discredit me with personal attacks. They said, hey, he's biologist turned activist, turned activist, a turn. You can't be a scientist and an activist. They tried to discredit me, but when they were interviewed by New Yorker magazine, they said it simply wasn't true. I must be crazy. I must be making it up. They said, and I quote, I am troubled by a suggestion that we have ever tried to discredit anyone. Our focus has always been on communicating the science and setting the record straight. I am troubled at the suggestion that we've ever tried to discredit anyone. Where on earth would I have gotten the idea that they tried to discredit me? Well, it turns out they settled out of court, a $105 million lawsuit, and all of their secret, their secret like, how are we going to get Tyrone notes came out from their meetings. Their strategy became public. And look what the first goal on the science was in their program. <laughs> Where on earth did anybody get the idea that they would ever try to discredit anyone? I had to make a change. Academia, my advisor told me, don't be an advocate. Let the science speak for itself. But I had to think about this, that we're being rewarded in the ivory tower, promoted for publishing things that the public doesn't have access to. I changed my mind about this philosophy because Syngenta, the company, says on their website they assume no obligation to update forward-looking statements to reflect actual results. Pardon my language, but who says shit like that? <laughs> but what concerned me more is that the EPA says that the ultimate decision of whether or not to ban atrazine is much bigger than science. It weighs in public opinion. And I thought the EPA is counting on my mom. The EPA is counting on you 
to help it make its decision, and I'm publishing my work in journals that you can't get in Barnes and Noble. We have to change the way we do things in the ivory tower. There's a philosophy by a great thinker that goes like this. Those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. This guy said that, by the way. And I didn't grow up privileged. I don't know about you. All I know is that now I'm here. Now you are here. You are privileged and you have a duty. And I've reasoned that we can change the past, but only if we act now while it is still the future. <laughs>